Weet jij dat? Jij hebt Spaans gehad, toch? Heb jij, heb jij Spaans gehad? Hoe spreek je de hoofdstad van Paraguay uit? Asuncion of Asuncion? A-S-U-N-C-I-O-N. Oké, dan zoek ik het even op. During the 1930s, power dynamics and political changes occurred on the European continent. At the same time, across the ocean, in the Grand Chaco, there was an extremely exhausting, costly and disastrous war for both participants, Bolivia and Paraguay. The war itself was marked by mismanagement on the Bolivian side and the aftermath marked a turning point in the history of both countries, as a period of economic and political chaos ensued. Today we'll look at the bloodiest military conflict fought in Latin America during the 20th century, over a desert. The Grand Chaco is a desert with bushes and wide plains of sand spanning around 250 square miles, about 640 square kilometers. Between the rivers Pilcumayo and Paraguay, which culminate near the capital of Paraguay, Asuncion. Its drought render it sparsely populated with an early Spanish explorer recalling how he found the remnants of paradise after it was burned by God. Back when the Spanish Empire ruled over its part of Latin America, the sparse population of missionaries and natives of the Gran Chaco fell under the jurisdiction of the Audiencia of Charcas, present-day Bolivia. During the early 19th century, the Latin American Wars of Independence were fought and the new republics of Paraguay, Bolivia and Argentina were formed. All of these republics could provide documents that supported their claim to the Gran Chaco because the former Spanish borders were confusing. They overlapped and the area itself was badly mapped and relatively unknown. Argentina took part of the Gran Chaco they considered theirs after their crushing defeat of Paraguay in the War of the Triple Alliance, the most bloody interstate war in Latin America's history. Yet even after this war, the conflict between Paraguay and Bolivia over the Gran Chaco territory continued. It wasn't just because of territory, it was because of what could be potentially in the ground. In the Andes Mountains, close by, oil was found, and some voices were speculating that the Gran Chaco could be rich in oil as well. Both sides employed fanatic scholars who referred to themselves as shakologists. These shakologists published books which confirmed the claim to the territory of either side, as the archives were messy, incomplete and partisan, thus not one explanation could be considered the right one. It came down to this, Bolivia wasn't rich, Paraguay even less so, and the Gran Chaco was too far away. It was verbally that the dispute was present, but it had to wait until the physical occupation of the Gran Chaco for it to escalate. This occupation was easiest for Paraguay. Around 1888, the Argentinian businessman Carlos Casado received a concession of 6 million square miles and other Argentinians, several Paraguayans and British companies were looking for ground as well. Around 1925, around 50 million dollars was invested in the Gran Chaco and a Paraguayan could argue that such an important part of the Republic's economy depended on this area that losing the Gran Chaco would be compared to an amputation that the country would most likely not survive. The process of Bolivia penetrating the Gran Chaco was quite a different one. You see, Bolivia had lost its small coastal strip next to the Atlantic Ocean after it lost the War of the Pacific against Chile in 1884. Afterwards, a near geographical claustrophobia emerged within the country that was abused by politicians for their own gain. It wasn't rare for politicians to point to the Gran Chaco and state that it could be a new opening to the Rio de la Plata. Bolivia certainly had the instruments to back up a potential claim, at least so it seemed. They had an air force were richer and more densely populated, allocated two million pounds for new Vickers weaponry, and their chief of staff of the army and minister of war was Hans Kunt, who used to be a general in the German army and now sold his experience training soldiers of the Bolivian armed forces. Bolivia decided to construct so-called fortines, small military posts at the Gran Chaco, to which Paraguay retaliated with building their own fortines. And that is when the incidents started happening. 
In March 1981, Daniel Salamanca became president of Bolivia and he took a war hawk-like attitude towards the whole gun Shako dispute. He didn't know much about war, nor about geography, and perhaps it was mainly the theatrical aspect that he embodied as he steered towards the war. But steering towards the war he did. When he ordered the Bolivian army to attack a Paraguayan garrison in Vanguardia, war broke out. The Bolivian generals had told Salamanca that within three months Bolivia would be dictating the peace in Asuncion. The war started in May 1932 and ended three years later with the complete expulsion of Bolivia from the Gran Chaco. While the war was a disaster for both parties, in order to understand how Bolivia lost, a rather simple element should be shed light on, water. The war was mainly a war of connections and of accessibility of resources, and the Paraguayan general José Félix Estigaribia understood this. He exclaimed to his officers, this will be the war of thirst, and I will drink to victory. Paraguay had water located closest to its front lines, owned railway lines to supply the troops, and these troops knew the Gran Chaco area a bit better. Bolivia, on the other hand, wasn't exactly adept at finding water during the war, and the supply lines between the army and the home front were too thin throughout the war. As for General Kunt, he was old school, still convinced trench warfare was the way to go. He refused to give up any territory and Salamanca supported him thoroughly, openly connecting the prestige of Bolivia as a whole to the 14s that were rather useless. It resulted in Bolivian troops sacrificing themselves for a strategically useless territory. When Kunt ordered the attack, his troops surrounded the Paraguayans, employing the same battle tactics the Germans had employed on the Western Front during the First World War. A crucial mistake was that to employ this type of warfare, water is necessary to quench the thirst of troops in this climate. Even if they had water, however, the Bolivians didn't have enough grenades to properly assault the Paraguayans. The Paraguayans, on the other hand, under Estigaribia, were prepared for the old school way of waging war. Estigaribia had read up on Kunt and what he was taught in military school, what battle tactics he favored and what he did during the First World War. Estigaribia stated, his only order tends to be forwards, preferably communicated by phone. Now, while sources vary, Bolivia mobilized between 200 and 250,000 troops, whereas Paraguay mobilized around 140 to 150,000 troops. As the war waged on, President Salamanca started getting more and more involved with the strategies of General Kunt. He used his rights as president to declare himself Captain General of the Armed Forces and, not completely against expectations, increased the ineptness of the leadership of the Armed Forces. He wasn't a military man, nor was he able to properly arrange the finances. Kunt wasn't a tactical genius either, ordering many frontal assaults, not investing in a Bolivian intelligence service and often ignoring reports about enemy movements. As Bolivian forces kept being encircled and destroyed, things reached a low point for Kunt at the siege of Campo Villa. He lost over 8,000 troops and Salamanca dismissed him in anger, upon which Kunt left the country. Kunt's dismissal didn't increase the situation for the Bolivians though, and eventually, in November 1934, the Colonel José Toro and Major German Bush instigated a military coup against Salamanca, replacing him with his Vice President José Luis Tejada. Apparently after the coup, Salamanca said that it was the only maneuver in which his generals had been successful. Bolivia never really found its true commander during the war, whereas Paraguay had José Félix Estigaribia. Together with president and intellectual Eusebio Ayala, Estigaribia was one of the few professional soldiers Paraguay had been able to afford, and he was a sober man not drinking during wartime and smoking merely one cigarette a day. As for Ayala, he was a skilled diplomat, and while international negotiators often attempted to make him sign agreements that weren't beneficial for his country, he managed to continue the fight and utilize the few resources Paraguay had more efficiently than Bolivia used theirs. When the final balance was made up, Paraguay had spent around $120 million on the war, a large sum for the country. Still, it was around half of what Bolivia had spent. While Bolivia was in this war alone, Paraguay received material aid from Argentina, 
who weren't too eager to see Bolivia have a harbor at Rio Paraguay, nor have Bolivia threatened Argentine's territory in the Gran Chaco. It supplied grenades, weapons, fuel, and aided in the purchase of trucks. Furthermore, military intelligence was passed on, and it offered two interest-free loans to Paraguay. While the Argentinian foreign minister, Carlos Saavedra Lamas, managed to broker a negotiated settlement of the dispute and chair the assembly of the League of Nations after the war. It is interesting that he received the Nobel Peace Prize that same year. Anyway, multiple setbacks for Bolivia, a Paraguayan advance all the way towards the oil fields near Camiri, mismanagement within the Bolivian military leadership, all culminated in the war not looking good for Bolivia. The League of Nations offered peace deals that did not reassure the country's attacks in the future wouldn't happen. All the while, both countries were making sacrifices that were near fatal, and an armistice would, for Paraguay at this point, be worse than it would be for Bolivia. Eventually, in June 1935, Paraguay advanced to such a point that Bolivia was forced to sign a peace treaty in Buenos Aires, in which Paraguay received three-fourths of the territory of the Gran Chaco. Bolivia lost 57,000 men, Paraguay lost 36,000. These numbers were extremely heavy, nearly a quarter of each armed forces. The economic and social pressure the war had caused would cause radical changes in both republics. The 20 years that followed were marked by economic and political chaos. What did Paraguay gain though? It certainly wasn't oil, as later on it was discovered the Gran Chaco did not contain any oil. This war laid the basis for the Sexenia and the period of social revolution during the 1950s in Bolivia, but that's a story for another time. Thank you for watching this video, and what is a person or event in Latin American history that you would like to know more about and perhaps see a video of? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to my channel. See you next time.